The outbreak of the war, both Presidents Putin and Zelensky vowed to end the fight with victory within a year. Well, two years on, there's still no end in sight. Joining me in the studio is Professor Michael Clark to talk a bit more about this in depth. So, at the start of this conflict, uh, what are your thoughts then? That was two years ago that we were perhaps stood here talking about what lies ahead. Two yeah. years on... Yeah, Leah, I, I mean, I think we've, we're seeing the return of industrial warfare to Europe. I've been mm. saying that for a little while. We didn't think we would see it after 1945, but it's back with us again now, which means that it's, the war is, is won by the side that can gear up its industry to fight long campaigns in what is going to become some sort of war of attrition. And it began two years ago. The Russians, as it, as it were, created a pendulum swing towards themselves. They moved against Kiev. They moved westwards from uh, the Donbass, west to try to take this land bridge uh, towards Crimea, which they did. They took Kherson. They got stopped at Mikolaev. They got stopped at Mariupol for quite a while, and they were stopped in Kiev, and that was critical. And then the pendulum began to swing back to Ukraine. Uh, in the autumn of 2022, there was a, a, a quick um, surprise offensive in Kharkiv, which was successful, yeah. threw the Russians out of Kharkiv altogether. There was another one west of the Dnieper River in Kherson, in Kherson Oblast. And then we thought the pendulum was moving decisively back towards Ukraine. There was a big uh, offensive, Ukrainian offensive, that started on the 4th of June. It concentrated on Odekiv, uh, south, trying to cut this land bridge. It only got about 30 kilometres because of Russian defences. And then the pendulum's begun to swung back to... Russia again. They've tried all along the front to make inroads. And last weekend, they succeeded at Avdivka. And that is strategically quite important because it might allow them to take the rest of the Donbass. And when Avdivka fell last weekend, that was a big plus for Russia, a big negative for Ukraine. And so I think we'll see as the year goes mm. on, the Russians will try to consolidate in the Donbass. The Ukrainians, I'm sure, will try to put Crimea under more pressure. But I don't think either of them will make any really strategic breakthroughs this year. We're looking really at the beginning of next year, which is why mm. it comes back to the industrial capacity that both sides can uh, employ. And also, in the, the long game of war that we're talking about here, funding is so, so important. And we've seen over the last few months that support perhaps is waning in that area, financial support, Michael. Yeah, I mean, Leah, this is a, a, a rough chart of the uh, degree of support that's gone to Ukraine mm. so far. So this is in billions of dollars, and the EU has put in about $90 billion. The United States has put in about $70 billion, and he's looking to put another $60 billion in. That's the, the aid that is stalled in Congress. But, of course, the red and the blue is important. The blue represents financial support... So the EU has kept the government running in Ukraine. The Americans have kept the military running in Ukraine. That's the red. That's really important because without the um, extra $60 billion, the Americans won't deliver, can't deliver legally any more ammunition. So they haven't had any more uh, supplies since December. And, of course, Donald Trump, his influence on the Republicans, is holding back that aid package so far uh, very mm. effectively. It probably won't go through, not in the form that uh, President Biden wanted it to. OK, so what can we expect then moving forward, do you think? Well, Leah, this has become a, a, a conflict which is about more than Ukraine itself. Of mm. course, it's about the existence of Ukraine. It's about the independence of Ukraine. The mm. Russians say that Ukraine doesn't deserve to exist. It should be part of Russia. And every now and again, they make genocidal statements about the Ukrainians. And sometimes we think they might be satisfied with the Donbass this time, but there'll be another time and so on. So it's about Ukraine. But it's about more than that as well. Because the Western world has committed itself again and again to supporting Ukraine. And it seems to come down to a sort of a competition between these two men, a 71-year-old traditional dictator warmonger, as opposed to a 46-year-old old former comedian who's now yeah. the saviour president of an independent Ukraine. But it's about much more than that. The Western world has said that Ukraine is the crucible for the ability of the Western democracies to push back against this tide of autocracy which seems to be taking over the world. And the rest of the world, the, the, the global south, as we call it, is standing back to see what happens. And if the Western world is seen to be a paper tiger, to, is seen not to be able to deliver on its commitments then the rest of the world will take due notice of that and will begin to lean towards Putin and Xi Jinping in China uh, and um, other dictators on the assumption that the world is really now moving in their direction. OK, so, so interesting. Michael, thank you, as always.